All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome to meeting number three of the General Government Licensing Committee. Uh, you can follow the agenda and debate on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca backslash council. There's also a screen for anybody visiting in the room uh, if you want to follow the agenda at the back. Uh, the General Government Licensing Committee acknowledges the land we're meeting on as the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anadashabi, the Chippewa, the Huronoshawnee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty Number 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, at this point, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none. Um, and just a reminder that if you do want to declare a Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, uh, there is a form that Julie here beside me will give you, uh, so it can be submitted to the Clerk's Office. Um, if you need any more information on our, our obligations under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, I would refer you to the Integrity Commissioner's Interpretation Bulletin, which I believe Julie also has copies of as well. And if you require advice, I encourage you to reach out to the Integrity Commissioner directly. Uh, saying all of that, uh, we'll go through the agenda. Um, so I need a motion to confirm the minutes of our last meeting on March 5th, 2019. Councillor Holliday, all in favour? Carried. Uh, speakers in presentation, we have one speaker listed on number eight of the green sheets in front of you under item number eight. Uh, I'll go through the agenda. Uh, item number one, divisional overview of municipal licensing and standards. There's a presentation on that. Uh, number two, largest uh, property tax debtors with tax arrears greater than $500,000 as of December 31st, 2018. So moved. Councillor Holliday is moving for receive for information. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number three, amendment to purchase order number 6044338 for Toronto City Hall building envelope improvements. Councillor Nunziata is holding number three. Thank you. Uh, number four, amendment to blank and cotton. Amendment to blanket contract number 47020781 with Cossack Communications Incorporated for Creative Marketing Agency Services. Anybody want to move the recommendations? Councillor Karajanis moving the recommendations to number four. All in favor? Carried. Uh, number five, amendment to purchase order number 6043129 for the McCowan District Park Phase 2 development or Part 2, the artificial ice rink and skating path construction. Councillor Holliday is moving the recommendations. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number seven, non-competitive contract for essential medical services for the Toronto Fire Services. Councillor Karajanis, holding. Sorry, did I skip six? I did skip number six. Councillor Karagiannis is holding number seven. Uh, number six, amendment to existing vendor of record agreement with Open Tax Corporation for the purchase of enterprise information management products and services. Anybody want to move the recommendations? Anybody? Somebody move the recommendations? Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Councillor Holliday is moving the recommendations number six. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number eight, start up and residence pilot project for the City of Toronto. We have a uh, deputation on that. And then I have an item to introduce motion and new business, which is the pink sheet in front of you. Uh, asking staff to give us an update on the Civic Innovation Office. So I need a motion to introduce that, Councillor Matlow. And uh, if you know, every, and I'll just, I don't know if everybody needs a moment to read it. <clears throat> Good. All in favor of the recommendation, Councillor Matlow. Carried. All right. We will go back to the beginning. So we have a divisional item number one, our divisional overview by municipal licensing and standards.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to address the committee. Um, I'd like to thank Chair Ainsley and um, DCM, Acting DCM Brealey and Councillors for this opportunity to speak with you today. We're going to talk a little bit about MLS and uh, some of the past work that we've done with the Licensing and Standards Committee. And then we're going to talk about some of the items that will be coming before this committee. I have with me my colleague, uh, Carlton Grant, who needs no introduction. Um, Carlton will be the next uh, ex Executive Director of Municipal Licensing and Standards. So to begin, uh, Municipal Licensing and Tra Standards con contributes to the safety, vibrancy, and maintenance of our communities by being a leader in the professional delivery of bylaw enforcement, administration, and of course, animal care services to the City of Toronto. MLS aims to deliver effective, efficient, and professional services that enable and enhance safety and standards within our communities, quality of life for visitors with, with uh, residents and their pets, and a business's ability to operate successfully within the City of Toronto. The uh, MLS, MLS leadership team is made up of myself, the uh, Interim uh, Executive Director of Municipal Licensing and Standards. Uh, we also have Fiona Chapman, who's the Director of our Business Licensing and Regulatory Services Group. Uh, Rod Jones, who is the Director of Bylaw Enforcement. Mark Schrager, who is the Director of Investigation Services. Of course, Carlton Grant, Policy and Strategic Support. And uh, Toronto Animal Services is led by our Chief Veterinarian, and uh, Interim Director of Animal Services. Uh, divisional directions, we have four primary divisional directions, supporting our people, excellent customer service, focus on bylaw and compliance, and transformation and modernization. We've been working very hard on each of these four areas, starting with supporting our people, we are improving our training programs and really investing in our staff development programs. This is high priority for municipal licensing and standards and one that uh, we're working uh, strategically to achieve, not just within municipal licensing and standards, but with our partners in Toronto and outside of Toronto. Safe working procedures for bylaws investigations, and there's a lot of health and safety uh, work going into um, this component. Excellent customer service and experience. We're improving knowledge base and referrals within 311, working very hard with our partners in 311. Quality assurance, updating standard operating procedures and uh, for enforcement of investigations, of, as well as revisiting our bylaws. Proactive education in the public uh, about our bylaws and compliance. Focus on bylaws and compliance. We're reviewing business licensing, Chapter 545. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, that is a huge bylaw that uh, governs about 60 business types under it. So there's a lot of work to be done within Chapter 545. Uh, we also license vehicles for hire, which is Chapter 546, and regulations for payday lending, body rub parlors, and holistic centers and bars, restaurants and nightclubs. I'm really glad we changed the body rub parlors to body rub parlors. So you might have that in your notes somewhere. We did catch it at the last minute. Uh, modernizing of Toronto Licensing tri Tribunal and implementing short-term rental bylaw program. And then finally, transformation and modernization. Uh, this is something that we are also very dedicated to and have st has started to uh, work at some of, in some of our business units. Also looking at data-driven intelligence and analysis to enforce some of our bylaws because some of our bylaws don't lend themselves uh, easily to targeted enforcement. Uh, so using the data that we have is going to allow us to be a little bit better strategically prepared uh, to address uh, those issues. 2018 highlights, 120,000 business licenses, 81,000 pet licenses. We updated seven bylaws within this time frame. We uh, conducted 40 public consultations. 
We also completed 180,000 bylaw investigations, and we have 235 bylaw officers enforcing 30 bylaws. Just an overview of some of the uh, matters that did go to the Licensing and Standards Committee. Uh, the Licensing and Standards Committee primary focus was consumer safety and protection with a mandate to monitor and make recommendations on the licensing of businesses and enforcement of property standards. Uh, we also enforced animal bylaws as well as the public spaces bylaws. Uh, primary, primarily supported by municipal licensing and standards, uh, the Transportation Services also reported to municipal, uh, the Licensing and Standards Committee uh, on their street art grant component of the graffiti management plan. During this time frame, we held 27 meetings with 40, 54 staff reports from MLS. We also tabled and discussed 121 agenda items and heard from a total of 540 deputants. Some of our major achievements during this time, uh, we approved new regulatory bylaws for licensing and registration of short-term rentals, licensing of vehicles for hire, rental apartment buildings, which is the Rent Safe TO program, and residential construction dust. We also created licensing categories for payday loan establishments and commercial parking lots. We also modernized by bylaws for dangerous dogs, including the Dangerous Dog Tribunal, which is a new publicly appointed tribunal, which will come on stream in May of this year. Uh, we also looked at modernizing the fence bylaw, street vending, and the tow truck industry. We also launched a pilot on backyard hens. Now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Carlton Grant. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Municipal Licensing Standards is a unique division uh, when it comes to governance and uh, the new committee structure. Um, our division reports to four different committees. Uh, many divisions typically go to one, and, in the, and traditionally we have in the past gone to licensing and standards. With the new governance structure, we report to this committee, General Government Licensing, on business licensing matters. Um, but we're also going to go into planning and housing on um, items related to rent safe or housing issues or property standards. Uh, Economic Community Development Committee. We were there last week on patios and we will be there on Wednesday with noise. Um, we're also going to exec in May on guns and ammunition. So our division, uh, again, very unique, broad uh, services. So we report out to a number of, of different committees and that's what this uh, slide is really trying to illustrate. With this is our, our, our policy approach and uh, there's five distinct areas um, and you typically see the, the fourth area, the reporting, where we, we sit down with you, we review briefing notes on certain issues or we bring the staff report here. Our job is to provide you with the information you need to debate, uh, to debate issues, provide us with direction and guidance and then make decisions. This is, uh, again, graphically trying to identify uh, our policy approach and what, what is mainly seen by the public and committee and council are, is the staff report and that's the piece above the water level and that is the iceberg. Um, but there's a huge amount of work that goes on beneath the surface, um, uh, the end-to-end -end product that a lot of people don't see. Uh, the bulk of the work is below the water level. Uh, we believe in a very comprehensive uh, review, broad, inclusive as possible. So there was an earlier slide that we did 40 consultations in 2018. We have already hosted 21 public consultations and 14 targeted stakeholder meetings in the first three months of this year. It has been a very aggressive spring um, and that's why you haven't seen any items from us here. We've been out in the field uh, meeting with all the various stakeholders but over the next few months you will start seeing staff reports from us. Another big piece of our work is public education. Um, and these are a few examples of our expanded communications. Improving communications with the businesses that we regulate and so the public has a clear understanding of what, uh, what we're working on. Another big piece, um, everyone is very interested in the work that we do. So uh, last year alone we had 445 media calls and this year again in the first three months we've already, also had, we've already had 104 requests for media to explain what we're doing and how we do it. The work plan over the next two years um, is, is what I'm trying to articulate here, but I just want to step back a little bit and say in the last two terms of council, our division has received 378 directives from City Council. Um, the licensing standard 
Standards Committee and other standing committees. Um, we've, and in the last two terms, we've responded to 198 of these. So we still have 180 to go, 67 of which will come to this committee. So there's a, a large number of outstanding work that we're, we're trying to tackle. We're managing that by putting it into um, uh, projects where we bundle like directives together and then we report back. And again, we're in a unique situation that we're reporting back to four different committees. Uh, what you will see coming uh, here um, next month, um, if all things work out, is a report on body rub parlors and holistic centers. Uh, clothing drop boxes we had here in January and it was accelerated to come back in May. Uh, vehicles for hire will come in June and food premises again, um, I believe we're looking at June as well. In the third quarter, uh, payday loan establishments, a big body of work we did last year by requiring payday loans to be licensed municipally as well. We put a cap on them. A lot of good work by Councillor Nunziata uh, to get that policy through. Uh, so it's reporting back a year's time. And then later in the year, we're on the 545 bylaw, which is our business licensing bylaw. Um, it's a very uh, large bylaw, so trying to bring back pieces and try to address some of the, the issues that have been raised by by committee and council related to restaurants and nightclubs and improving the Toronto Licensing Tribunal. And that ends our presentation and open it up to questions. Okay. Thank you very much for coming in this morning. Really appreciate it. Uh, Councillor Nunziata, I saw your hand first. Okay, well, thank you for this, because uh, actually I was wondering er, before we started the meeting, where are the licensing issues? I haven't seen any. So you, you, in this report you've identified, um, but uh, just questions. Um, is, is there any way that we can get a list of all the outstanding requests that have been made? Um, I have one for 2011 that you haven't brought forward yet. Um, you know, the marketing. So we need, I, we need to have a list of all the ones that you haven't reported on and that are, you know, some of them are over 10 years. Um, and, and, and the reason why you haven't reported back on them. Um, if we can have that at the next meeting, then the, I didn't, I didn't see any, anywhere on this list, the Airbnb. Um, when's that coming forward? Um, and the clothing boxes, I see that being in the first quarter, but um, I'm, I'm really concerned that there's a number of um, items that we have, we have brought forward at the licensing in the past and motions that I have made in the past that we have not seen reports on it, which are very important issues that affect all of us in our community. So if you can just comment on that and... Uh... Yeah, absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, you are right, there are a number of uh, large outstanding directives, but we've also been hit with a number of new business types over the last two or three years that have really impacted our, our workload. Um, but we can commit to bringing the next meeting a kind of synopsis of the outstanding items and um, their status, whether complete, incomplete, and where they are and when they are coming. With respect to Airbnb, that is an item that will be before the Planning and Housing Committee because it's about uh, housing and the impact on housing and the impact of affordability of housing. While they are registered with us, and the platforms will have a business license. The clerks and city manager's office, when we discussed governance, felt that those were really best before planning and housing committee. Okay, but it's my understanding that uh, uh, a lot of them were, were having problems with in the community uh, that were saying to residents, we, we can't uh, close them down, we can't enforce it. The ones that, are having, that we're having problems with, and y you know those ones where they're having parties yep. and weekends, and we're telling residents that, um, that we can't enforce the bylaw because we haven't passed the bylaw. So, the um, so I mean, I'm very confused on that because I, I have a lot of issues in my ward, and I'm sure other members of council as well. So when are we going to see that, where in fact that we can close them down um, so and, yeah. and then that, that one for the marketing for 2011? We, we have reported back on that. I will, I will come to your office and actually bring the documentation that supports that that, was, that has been completed. Okay. So what about the Air, Airbnb? So the Airbnb, um, there's two pieces to it. There's a zoning piece and a licensing piece. And in order to license, you need to have proper zoning. City planning was our partner in this. They brought zoning forward. It went to the LPAT, the, what is now uh, the, the OMB, and it was appealed. 
and it's appealed and they, they felt they needed five days to discuss it and it's been uh, held over until July August. or August, August. Of, of this year. So we cannot proceed until then. However, on the party house and investigations, our, our team and investigation services will enforce and will uh, on an address by address look at those properties and work to shut them down or to have the platform shut them down. We cannot move forward with a licensing or a registration regime until the zoning authorities have been granted. And the LPAT, once they meet in August, it still may take them two or three months to come to a decision. And then it's gonna take us a few more months to wrestle with that decision and then to operationalize it. So unfortunately, we're equally um, disappointed that it, it isn't enacted and it is causing impacts in our community, but we, we are challenged that, the, um, that a number of members did appeal this and that's within their rights. And so that, that's coming up in August, did you say? The August is when the hearing is. There'll be five days of hearing, but then the, the, the board could take six to eight to 12 weeks to render a decision. And then we have to get that decision, then we have to operationalize that. And, and, and so um, it's my understanding when we discussed it the last time, if somebody runs an, a, an Airbnb for the weekend, to a, a group that wants to have a you know 24/7 party on the, in the backyard on the streets and that that they, right now they don't have to register with the city at all. That's that's correct. They can just do what they want. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Matlow, questions. Hi. There are. Um, I, I hear re repeated complaints by residents um, that there's a dearth of, of, of adequate enforcement or, or time frames for enforcement on a number of different bylaw infractions. So for example, if you, um, if you report a, a noise bylaw infraction, let's say a contractor is uh, doing work on a Sunday afternoon or at uh, five in the morning or what have you, uh, a resident is asked to call 311. They do that and they're told that a bylaw enforcement officer may come within five days. Challenge is, is that if they come in five days, um, typically it won't address the situation that they are experiencing that night or that day where their lives are being impacted, but also it's difficult to be able to obtain any evidence to be able to prosecute. So um, my question is, have you been looking at how to better address more reasonable time frames, resident expectations on that. That is one example, and then there are many other examples like that. And then the second part of the question is, I understand that uh, you've you've had trouble, uh, you have a budget to hire more enforcement staff, and that hasn't happened yet due to perhaps some challenges, and I wonder if you could tell us about that, if that's true. Okay, through the chair, uh, we have introduced shifts in the noise uh, to address noise bylaw issues as well as a number of uh, bylaw infractions that are occurring outside the normal business hours and we are working towards a prioritization on specifically noise calls but other types of calls that occur after hours so if you do call 311 our business rules are going to be changing on response times to those types of calls <clears throat> We're just uh, in the midst. Um, we hope in April this, which is to, well, Today, this month. Wednesday. Wednesday. Um, we, uh, we are going to be introducing new prioritization to specifically noise calls, but other types of bylaw infractions that are occurring outside the normal what, what, what is, business hours. What does that look like? Uh, we have shifts from 6 a.m. to that run to 3 a.m. the next morning, uh, depending on whether they're um, investigation services or the bylaw enforcement team. Uh, those shifts look slightly different, but there yeah, are. Would, would, would you just pause for one moment? Uh, speaking of noise bylaws, hey guys, just quiet down as you fill up this hand truck. Um, please proceed. Sure. Uh, so depending on when those infractions are occurring, we will have support in the field in enforcement. Well, what would that look like as far as a different, like if you, if you're so a if resident, you call, you call, if you call 311, what are you going to hear? So through the chair, if you call 311, we will be providing them with new response times based on the noise types. And those service requests will be created and sent to the division, and then staff will be picking up those calls. Okay. On a much uh, I, I just need to, I, I'm not getting a picture though. Okay. So, um. There's a, there's a contractor drilling at three in the morning, keeping me and my whole, all my neighbors up. 
Uh, what am I going to hear when I call 311? So through the chair, uh, those types of calls, uh, you, th what you'll likely hear, we haven't done the scripts yet, but what you'll likely hear is uh, the, the service request will be sent to the division, and then the division will target that specific construction site. Like that night? Uh, perhaps the following night. Uh, depending on how many complaints are going on at that construction site. Okay, so I, I look forward to hearing more detail once you write the scripts and absolutely out the details. The but uh, that's that's very good news for for residents if that's if that's something that you are focusing on because it has been a constant uh, uh, irritant uh, uh, for people. Uh, the other question about staffing. Okay, so uh, with respect to staffing, we are just putting through a class of I believe 26. Uh, new recruits, so that process is well underway. Um, we're in the process of testing shortly, and we should have those folks on the road by July. Um, so you're going to be fully fully staffed by July. Yes, uh, that is our hope through What's the chair. Been, was, what has been the challenge? Uh, the challenge is retirements, people leaving for new um, opportunities, getting new positions, and trying to. Uh, fill them as fast as we can. It's uh, it's a long process from beginning to end, from the time you get that position to you do your rec. So we're working with HR, um, trying to streamline the process as much as possible. Last quick question: um, Are you do you plan to bring candid recommendations to us, not only what to enforce, but perhaps how to better manage uh, and mitigate uh, expectations as well? Uh. Through the chair, can you clarify what Me, you mean? Meaning, by meaning, you at your limit. May, may I just kind of clarify that? Sure. Thank quickly. you. Quickly. Uh, very quickly. Meaning that uh, are there? Uh, have you considered are there are there bylaws or, th or things that we've done and maybe more you know uh, on, a, on a popular initiative politically at times that may not make sense or we may not actually realistically be able to manage those very well? And are you looking at reviewing what we have now to enforce and perhaps coming to us and tell us you know maybe we shouldn't be doing things certain ways? I mean, have it, just to make it more refined and efficient. Through the chair, realistic. that's something that municipal licensing and standards is considering all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. Councillor Karagiannis, questions of staff? Yes. Um, thank you for coming in this morning. Really appreciate all your uh, contributions. Got a couple of questions for you. Street vending, how aggressively are we going after it? Um, I mean, how we're, are we handling it? Like a street vendor uh, that has a hot dog stand, he's got a 10 by 10, 10 by 20, What's? Um, I would say that's not one of our top priorities. So we're not aggressively going after hot dog or food truck vendors. Would it um, be if we come across something, we would act accordingly, but we are not, um, as Councillor Matlow and Nunziata said, there are a number of issues in this division that are impacting people that we need to prioritize and we need to focus on those, not necessarily hot dog carts or. Would it be something that you prioritize if it was in a landmark where a lot of um, people are visiting and they're looking at things and they're complaining and sort of shaking their heads? Um, like where we have a lot of tourists, would that be something that? If, if we are getting a um, significant number of complaints, yes, we would, we would act, but we are complaints driven. We do uh, respond to service requests based on complaints, yes. So somebody that has a hot dog stand, mm -hmm. what's the dimensions that he or she can have outside there? I mean, is it 10 by 20, is it 10 by 10, what, what's, what's the standard? Uh, I don't have the bylaw in front of me, it's probably 10 by 10. I don't think it's 10 by 20. Unless you apply, you can apply for additional space if you keep, if you want to sell additional food, food types, because we tried to move away from just the hot dog. Um, so there is an opportunity to expand, but it would be required uh, to get a permit from our division or facilities and real estate for the ones on Nathan Phillips Square. But the person that's running that should not have like four or five canisters of, of, of uh, tank, tanks. Uh, they shouldn't have those big, huge tanks. Yeah, yeah. And they shouldn't be having all their stuff, like the, their bread, all over the place, should they? No, you're right. They should be within that, that area. Um, vendors, the businesses that we license, tend to uh, leak out a bit, uh, take a little bit more space each day. And um, we're not getting com that many complaints on this, um, or we will be shortly. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we'll obviously look into it, but again, prior, priority-wise, uh, our sidewalks are important to us and the use of our sidewalks, but 
um, for someone to creep out six inches. But if, if it's if it's uh, egregious, absolutely, we would uh, we would, uh, would you educate them. To the complaints that I put forward regarding uh, hot dog vendors in front of City Hall. Uh, those may be pertaining to facilities and real estate because their contract is with uh, facilities and real estate, not us, but we will look. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my next question is the Airbnb. While they're in the OMB situation, can they still continue operating? Can they still continue doing what they're doing right now? So Councillor Cressy uh, and Councillor Wong Tam brought a notice of motion uh, forward a couple months ago asking Airbnb and other platforms to voluntarily comply with the bylaw. Um, they felt that they weren't able to do that. So the, the challenge we're in right now is a, um, an area where there are no distinct rules, which does make it a challenge. Um, we, if there, we are mostly concerned about the party house and the impact on the neighborhood if someone, you know, so again, on a priority base, if there are significant issues with noise reoccurring, impacts on the community, we will uh, investigate and enforce. How are you tracking the uh, Airbnb um, or other websites, especially the websites that are being hosted outside this country in different languages? How are you tracking them and uh, making sure that they comply with the, uh, the contributions that they have to make to the city? Are, are, you, um, uh, are, you, are, are you up to speed on that or is uh, I'm aware uh, you and I have spoken about this one before of uh, other sites out there or the Kijijis of the world or, or, or other types out there. This bylaw mainly goes after um, uh, the Expedias, the Airbnbs, those, those tr types of groups, but we need to, um, through our enforcement team and our compliance team, we need to be doing those uh, web-based searches to ensure that people are following the rules and then contributing through the, uh, the tax. Because there are sites out there that are actually you, you're paying in other countries in order to come over here, and, and we have absolutely no clue of it. Uh, my last question is uh, the PTS uh, slash tax consultations. Have you gone through all those consultations in the process of writing the report right now? Which one, sorry? PT, oh yes. So, P PT, PT. Yeah, so in the fall we held nine, and we just held another nine uh, over the last two months. Um, we are now in the analysis stage. Uh, we have a number of studies going on, uh, congestion, uh, economic impact, and uh, accessibility. So all of those pieces are coming together as well as surveys, as driver surveys, um, and, and general public surveys, and all that's being pulled together for a report to this committee in June. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Karagiannis. Uh, Councillor Holliday, questions of staff? Or the presentation, sorry. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I remember last term, we had a really interesting meeting between uh, the Transportation Committee and the Government Licensing Committee, and it, it had to do with uh, on-street uh, furniture and vendors. It was an interesting policy context where there were two committees kind of vying after the same issue. We ended up having that joint meeting. This term of council, I see the MLNS even more fragmented across a bunch of committees. Um, could you comment on whether your workload is up, down, or the same because of that fragmentation across committees? Does it matter? Yeah. I, I would say it's uh, significantly up. Um, while the governance looks great on paper and makes a lot of sense with the themes, we, my colleagues and I, have to attend. Um, in the past, we would attend licensing and standards and maybe a little bit of exec. Now, we, as, as much as the people here in this room, we will need to attend um, three standing committees on a regular basis prepare for all of those three, chairs briefings for all of those three. It is, it is a significant impact to, um, to me and my team and, and um, our, my enforcement operational staff as well to come and answer questions either it's on housing. So we are, we are on deck for uh, three committees at a, at a very minimum and sometimes exec as well. So it's, it's significantly increased. So that's your resourcing and I'm sensitive to that but yeah. That's not on my number one radar. What I'm really worried about is the quality of the policy outcomes that come out of the committee. In your observations thus far, uh, is it worth taking a closer look again at that governance to ensure we get the best policy outcomes? You know, case in point, um, signage. I think signage is now somewhere else. 
It's part of a property standards piece, yes. But it's also quite connected with businesses. And so, you know, where does that belong and how do you, how do you look after the needs of businesses and then think about the built environment? So in your approach, are there, are there some obvious things that you've seen so far that we might want to take a closer look at? Um, it's, it's a good question. What we've agreed to, uh, with the clerks on is when, once the report is written, and if the bulk of it has, relates to housing or property standards, or if the bulk of it relates to licensing, it, that's where it should go. So even though we plan for it coming a certain place, if the bulk of the direction that we want to move forward with will uh, dictate where it actually goes. So I, I wanted to ask about that. You, in your presentation, you talked about a conversation with the clerks and the city manager's offices about how the work is broken down and then sent out to the committees. How and where and when did that happen? Because I, I don't remember getting into the weeds at council about the new committee structure, but somehow these things worked out and I'm assuming it's those conversations. Yeah, that's correct. Um, our conversation started after the governance was adopted. Um, so, um, we weren't involved in, in it, again, um, but we're happy to follow um, the guidance of Council. Uh, I don't think, you know, maybe it was identified that um, that would uh, fracture us. I do want to comment, though, that the quality of the policy work will not change. Um, my team does an excellent job, and, they, and for those people who've been on this committee before have seen the, the increase in the quality of reporting that has come back to this committee year after year. So the quality of work will not change. We are just spread a little thinner. I also want to say that this is managed by a very small team of 10 people. Uh, four permanent, four temporary senior policy and research advisors, um, and a stakeholder engagement coordinator, and then a, um, a research coordinator. So uh, under Nagin's leadership, it is a small but mighty team that does excellent work uh, but we are, we are, we are taxed. So if I've got it right, you write the policy without a label of a committee on it. And that, and that way you're bringing your best policy forward and then the committee does its work, whatever committee is selected based on the subject matter. Um, I'm almost out of time. So I guess my last question is, I thought the joint committee last term was interesting and was helpful uh, because there were two different competing in some cases, competing interests in the policy. Uh, would you consider um, working with clerks to do more of those, where an issue straddles more than one committee and there's, there's obvious opportunities for really good dialogue? And I don't want to step on the role of council because that's the ultimate, but sometimes hashing this stuff out in the committee is valuable and it's time well spent. Yeah, so the report you're referring to last year was the Boulevard Cafe and Marketing right. Displays, which went to a joint of tra transportation services and, um, or public works, I think it was called, and yep. licensing and standards. So yes, those joint meetings are difficult to coordinate uh, to get it, both groups involved, uh, especially last year when we had 45 councillors and so you were looking at 16 councillors to coordinate. You guys are a little smaller now, so it's a little more nimble. Um, that work was sent to Economic and Community Development Committee uh, last month and then the council on Thursday it was approved. I still think we got good um, uh, feedback and value. It's the deputants that come and speak to it is a really important piece as well to, uh, to help you inform your decisions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Holliday. Councillor Fillion. Uh, thank you. Um, response times. Um, I guess in my experience, you have, a, there's sort of a, an ebb and flow. There'll be years when, um, the response time seemed to be fairly good, and then uh, that'll be followed by a period of time when they're terrible again, and then they'll be followed by a period of time when they're relatively good, and it just keeps going around in circles, um, and often based on who the staff are, in my perception anyway, based on who the staff are. So I'm wondering if we have standard response times for um, different different areas. Yes, we do. So, uh, same with Councillor Matlow's question. So, uh, noise, for example, if it's a bars and restaurants, it's two days. If it's a private property matter, it's five days. We are well aware of the inconsistencies in our own division and are working to to harmonize those response times uh, better. 
in such a way that we're consistent so the public is understanding how quickly someone's going to get out there and politicians yourself are councillors are aware of what the standards are so we, we it is a body of work that we need to do and elizabeth spoke to that that uh, we have different standards uh, we do track them but we need to make sure we're more consistent so if you have timelines could that be reported out to this committee relatively easily uh, through the chair uh, we do have uh, published response times that are accessible uh, and we can certainly provide them to the chair for this committee um, but the other point I'd like to make is um, a lot of our response times may be good and bad within the season just depending on the volume of work that we're receiving as well as the staffing so it's a bit of a balance but generally speaking we want to get to the point where our response times are consistent and the public can rely on those so that's that's the goal do we do um, proactive enforcement in order to reduce the amount of enforcement we need to do and I'll give you an example um, I think this only happened one year in uh, in North York some some years ago but um, there was a strategy to go after for tall grass and weeds complaints uh, identify all of the um, properties that were uh, an annual problem and to um, basically um, identify them early shorten the process and be in there cutting the grass um, ourselves within a very short period of time which would then of course cause people to comply if they know they can't you know that it, they're only going to get dinged once a year so through the chair we are reviewing those sorts of initiatives and depending on our uh, work volumes and our priorities within the division those uh, those strategies may change however I do know that that was a very um, popular uh, strategy amongst some people and not so popular amongst others so we're looking at all of those sorts of strategies to see how we can do our work better uh, more strategic more efficient more efficient okay on body rub parlors you mentioned that's coming next month is that what I heard? Um, that's our target. It is a very challenging file, um, complex file. So um, we want to make sure we get it right. Um, meeting deadlines is important, but uh, we need to make sure that our <coughs> policy rationale is fully cooked. That's, I'm all for getting that one right. Yeah. Um, um, Airbnb, I'm wondering if this, and I guess question partly of you, uh, Mr. Chair, but the um, you know, it, the Airbnb problem was both zoning and licensing. So uh, I think last time it came to both committees. And um, so I'm wondering whether it should not continue coming to both committees to uh, planning and housing for that aspect of it. But um, what, what they do or don't do could have an impact on ability to enforce for example so it seems like uh, you know it, uh, it should either be looked at at a joint meeting or by both committees concurrently yeah, that's a fair question we could look at sending the zoning piece to uh, planning and the licensing piece here as long as they go the same month and end up at council together was really the the important piece but it's something we will we will take under consideration okay thank you Thank you, Councillor Fillion. Uh, I think that's everybody. Speakers? Councillor Matlow? Oh, yes, I have a motion. I don't know if it's okay, so I think I have Councillor Matlow, Councillor Nunziata, Sorry. and then Councillor Fillion. I think um, I thought all the questions actually were very thoughtful by all the members. They hit on a number of different uh, concerns and, uh, and, and, and just general questions that I think all of us have been sharing. Uh, with the new with the new governance structure with the 25 ward um, makeup of council and the new uh, committee structure, uh, it, it really has been confusing about, you know, what goes where and as many of the members here said, sort of at the end of the day, you know, how do they drive together, especially when they have to work in concert with each other, but they're completely different areas of purview. And uh, so I don't know what the answer is, you know, whether, whether it be joint meetings and maybe as I think you alluded to, uh, uh, 
Carlton, about having a, um, you know, at, at least them coinciding in the same month and then and then arriving at council together so that we sort of meet essentially as a committee of a whole at that time and consider them as one piece. Challenge with that obviously though is that the committee, the committee process is supposed to be where we get into the, the weeds and into the detail and we're really what we're doing on each of these matters that are working in concert with each other in different committees is asking city council to do just that. So um, I don't know, you know where, where Councillor Filling was going, but if he was going in a direction where we might want to do a rethink on you know, how, how these reports come to whatever committee, that might be healthy. Um, intuitively, it doesn't seem to make sense to me yet, but uh, you may, you may uh, make an argument at some point that it does. I just, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem, to have you splintered in so many directions doesn't seem very uh, logical or functional to me. Uh, but uh, you know, I know I know we are we are terraforming as we're going through a whole governance review as well. Um, with respect to the questions that I was asking earlier about the enforcement uh, procedures, timeframes, response, um, this has just been such a pain for so long. Like I, I cannot, and, and it often comes on us as counselors. Like uh, so often, I'll wake up on a Saturday morning, and my Twitter feed is full of. Uh, uh, people uh, reaching out to me from a from a building uh, because uh, some you know cowboy contractor decided that four in the morning was a great time to do some work, and and they're saying you know Josh do something do something right now, and I'd love to be able to honestly say like call three one one and you'll get you'll get some support and and what I know is that that's not really good advice because they. What they'll do is they'll call 311 and then get a response saying that nobody's going to come now and they might come in five days and they'll just even get more frustrated and that's what happens often. So the very fact that you have said that you are, uh, you put your minds to this, that you are about to make an announcement imminently, uh, uh, fortunately not on April Fool's Day, so tomorrow people will take you seriously, uh, uh, is, is, is music to my ears and I know to so many residents who are kind of at that fed up state, and, and it's not just noise, it's other infractions. Um, and then leads me to, um, you know, we, we, we've had discussions in past years about certain bylaws that may just need a second look, that we may be raising expectations in some areas. I forget what it was called, the, um, I'm just blanking now, but you know, the ability to sort of, you know, trespass onto somebody else's property, and uh, there may be things that, do you, do, you, do you recall? Yeah, it's called right of entry. The right of entry, exactly. There may be certain certain um, certain policies that we created based on sort of our political needs at a certain moment in time that may also need a rethink because they're just not really uh, something that we should be uh, you know uh, addressing. And legally, we it's questionable if we really can. And we're setting expectations unreasonably high so that people will always be disappointed uh, in 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 the city's uh, response. So I guess in in a nutshell, I'd like to see the the governance improved in a way that just there's a clear path from you know policy recommendations to policy decisions and then back to implementation. Um, a better response time and the ability to do the job uh, within the realm of, of purview that we should have, and then and then a thoughtful look at where perhaps we should be setting expectations in a more realistic way, so that you're not overloaded. And I'll conclude by saying that I, you know, th the last two terms of council, I think a lot of the responsibility is rested on on council itself by overloading staff. I mean, every single thing that gets in the news, we go and tell staff we want you to write all these reports and start working on. And and meanwhile, you know, once you've got, you know, Uber hookah bars, uh, you know, you name it uh, on your plate, uh, how are you going to be dealing with noise? So um, I think we need to be more disciplined as well on how, what expectations we have of staff, and then they need to be better at telling us their timelines of reporting back. There you go. Well, back to you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So I do have a motion that the executive direct municipal licensing and standards be requested to be poured to the general government and licensing committee at its meeting on May 21st, 2019, 
on all outstanding report requests from the Municipal Licensing and Standards Division and expected timelines for these matters. Um, the reason I'm putting that forward is um, for, for those that have been members of council that have been sitting on licensing for the past few years, uh, know that there's been a number of requests that have been brought forward to the committee that, uh, and I understand, I mean, that they haven't been brought forward yet, but these, but some of these uh, requests, and Councilor Matlow, you're absolutely correct, council also makes uh, motions and, you know, um, but some of these issues are very, um, are very important to the community. And um, now that we're, you know, we're getting into the warmer months, I hope, I don't know, after this weekend. Um, but, you know, this is where the problems start escalating. And, um, and uh, with the, um, the, the clothing box, I know you're reporting back on that. This is, um, I know that it's been an issue with me and then the mayor put forward a request as well in January um, on uh, the number of clothing boxes and the, how people are just dumping garbage in front of the clothing boxes and furniture. There's been fires and everything else. And, um, and as well as the Airbnb is going to be a big issue when it gets warmer because most of these establishments that are renting them out for the weekend are renting them out for parties. And they have parties 24 seven, it's going in the backyard on the streets and the police are called and there's nothing the police could do. We can't uh, close them down and it's an ongoing issue. I don't know if other members of council are experiencing that, but I am. Um, and uh, then you, uh, there's the noise bylaw. So at police services, uh, a couple months ago, there was a report that was, uh, that we approved and that came to, uh, to council as well as, as far as the noise bylaws. So if there's uh, a party at two or three in the morning and a resident contacts the police, the police now will say it's the responsibility of the, of the city. The city has taken over that, uh, the noise now. And that's gonna be very difficult as well to enforce when you have these uh, establishments that are having parties at night and uh, disturbing uh, uh, the public. So these are issues that need to, I, I think we need to address. And, and um, I, I'm glad that you're, um, you're gonna be hiring the staff uh, by July, August. I mean, licensing and property standards has always been, in my opinion, is an area where um, we should have a lot of staff. Um, and to enforce the number of bylaws that we have um, is because that's where we get the most complaints from, from residents, it, are these issues. Uh, because it's people, residents could hear it, it's visible, people see it, and, uh, and, and, uh, and they'll contact the counselor's office or they'll contact 311. So these are, these are issues and bylaws that um, we need to enforce and, uh, you know, um, and, and, and some of these reports that, uh, that, uh, that we have requested, a few of them are a few years old. Um, now, I'm looking forward to that report, Carlton, but you said about the marketing. Uh, that was 2011. Um, but, um, you know, um, and I understand that when they do come forward to this committee, we're probably going to have tons of deputations because we always do. But, you know, they, it needs to be addressed. They're, in my opinion, they're very important issues um, that matter uh, to the community as well as the counselors. So I'm hoping that this report would come forward and then we can move on. And I agree. Um, uh, we, I was just questioning, uh, speaking to Councillor Matlow and Councillor Holliday before the meeting started, where are these items, right? And they're going to various committees and we're not sure which committee they're going to. And unless, you know, you attend these committee meetings and if there were um, uh, an issue that was brought up at licensing, that we need to go to these committees to speak on it. Um, if it's a, an issue that we Percy have brought forward at this committee. So we're gonna have to keep an eye on all the committees now and to see where these items that uh, we have been dealing with at licensing in the past few years appear on other agendas. So that's, uh, that's something we'll have to keep an eye on. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Nunziata. Uh, questions of the mover? Yes. Uh, Councillor Matlow's hand. Uh, thank you, and I, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to consider this as a friendly amendment, and if you don't, I'd like to ask a member who hasn't spoken yet to do so if they would like to. 
uh, which is um, to change uh, the request of your motion uh, to be a briefing note rather than a report to committee. For the very reason that you uh, said, uh, you and I are in 110% agreement with respect to the need to not only have the reports come back, but also to understand when they're coming back and have accountability for that. But to have uh, deputations over non-action items, in other words, just sort of like a report on where things are at, okay. it doesn't seem like an effective use of the committee's time nor the public's time, okay. but rather we get a briefing note so that we have the same information and then people can make deputations when, they, when, the, when there's actually something that we are debating and, and doing. But are you applying that the briefing will come to uh, the committee or just be sent to no, all uh, members uh, uh, members that are on the committee? Because uh, I think we all need that brief, uh, we all need that information. If I can just interrupt for a moment. So I was just discussing this with the clerk and so um, she was advising, if, so for a briefing out, uh, it would go to all members of council, that's not right. just the committee. Yeah, yeah that's <clears> fine. Yeah, so so that that's so briefing, the way the briefing notes work is that they're 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 sent to all members of council at the same time. At least they're supposed to work that way. And, um, but so in this case, we would have all the information. We would be aware of, of when their t what their time frames are. And then if you're unhappy or if I'm unhappy or if anyone's unhappy with what we read, then we can bring a motion saying speed it up or whatever. Yeah, that, that's fine with me. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just need to get that list. Yeah, the information yeah. will come. Yeah, yeah, that information. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the member will work on changing it. No, we can do a briefing note. I'm just timeline-wise, uh, what's reasonable. Uh, we have to pull this together. Um, and we don't want a briefing note on the timeline of your briefing notes, so uh, well, I, it's got to be realistic. I know that Tra I know that Tracy um, a few years ago brought forward that list through this uh, licensing. So all you have to do is just print it. <laughs> Updated. Updated. Uh, thank you, Councillor Matlow. Uh, Councillor Fillion to speak. Thank you. First, the motion that the Executive Director of Municipal Licensing and Standards be requested to report to the General Government and Licensing Committee in the second quarter of 2019 on timelines and proposed strategies and service standards for enforcement and proactive enforcement in areas where a significant number of complaints are received. So that's just in response to the question and answers about standards for timelines and, and strategies and it sounded from the answers as if that um, material pretty much already exists which is why I uh, figured we could get it in the second quarter. Um, on the, um, the Airbnb issue, uh, if I, rec I was on the planning committee and I certainly re last term remember it um, coming there and there, there being some significant housing issues such as the impact of Airbnb on um, affordable basement apartments um, in some areas in the city, that, that type of issue. But I think, um, and certainly the results of the um, T-Lab would, you know, logically go to the planning committee, however, um, most of the in the in the as for most of the public issues associated with um, Airbnb and other um, similar platforms um, is really an, an nuisance and enforcement issue. So I think it's you know where does it fall? I think it falls both places and. Um, um, and should either perhaps come both places or um, for the dis different aspects of it um, or should uh, there should be a joint uh, meeting or the the uh, the tribunal may pass exactly what we asked them to do and we just need that reported out that you know problem solved hopefully um, but I, I I guess I'll leave it to, leave it to the chair but but certainly if there's um, if we don't get what we want at the tribunal, I would imagine there will be new uh, enforcement issues to consider and those should logically come here. Questions of the mover? Sorry, Councillor Holliday? 
I actually had a point of order, Mr. Chair, um, and it's maybe it's a question for clerks, and it is uh, maybe a symptom of what I was bringing up in my conversation. We had heard earlier that um, the clerk's office can relabel a report going forward and direct it to the appropriate committee. In this case, I'm very interested in Councillor Fillion's report. Um, my concern would be is that if there is a predominant number of standards that require proactive enforcement that come up on the property standards side, for instance, long grass and weeds, is that label of um, general government and licensing committee going to be peeled off and the report's going to go over to that committee over there? I just want to make sure that it comes back to this committee because I, I respect and understand that there's a broad palette of things that can be uh, broadly enforced, or sorry, uh, proactively enforced. I just want to make sure we get the information back here. Okay. There's so a way to assure that it comes here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Questions of the mover? Seeing none. Uh, any other speakers on this item? Seeing none. Uh, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Uh, we really appreciate the presentation. I think it helps bring some clarity to, uh, as you said earlier, municipal licenses and standards kind of divided up between different standing committees. And I think any bit of clarity that can be brought to the table as we're getting used to the new system and governance model, I think is very important and keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, we should vote. <laughs> I was about to move on to something else. Mi All right, so we have a motion, uh, Councillor Nunziata. Mr. Chairman, yeah, um, the staff have reassured me that they'll send the briefing note to all members of council. As long as that happens, I will withdraw my motion. Okay. Uh, but if it favor. doesn't happen, it's coming back here. All in favor of Councillor Nunziata withdrawing our motion. Carried. Uh, motion by Councillor Fillion. On the screen, all in favor? Opposed? That carries unanimously. That's it. And that's it. And our next item is? Uh, carry on, Mr. Chair. Councilor I apologize, Fillion. I was late and I um, did send a message, but it didn't go through. Um, if we could reopen item number four. Okay. All right. Uh, all in favor of reopening item number four? Carried. All right, so then we just have to go back to item number three, amendment to purchase order number 6044338 for the Toronto City Hall building envelope improvements. Councillor Nunziata held this. Yes, so you're asking for an increase. <laughs> what else is new, right? Um, it, can you explain to me um, wh why the increase and why, why is it that uh, when we went up for tender, that wasn't part of the uh, tender. Um, through, through the chair, um, of the uh, the total amount of the um, of the amendment, uh, seventy percent of it is attributable to um, additional scope changes. Um, the first one being the uh, security film. That's a result of, of uh, a security request to put shatterproof uh, film on on the windows on the first, second and third uh, floors that uh, resulted after this project was underway. Um, um, so that uh, was a result of a security incident that, that was requested to be added in because this contractor could, um, could accommodate it. Um, the second additional scope change um, of number two there on, on the chart, um, there was one for the aluminum snap cap. So if you look at uh, figure, um, six on the report, those aluminum panels. Um, originally, we had uh, scope to have those um, aluminum strips between the windows uh, cleaned through a mechanical uh, solution. When we did the uh, trial uh, cleanup, it actually dulled the aluminum and um, Heritage wanted us to look at, at different ways of cleaning um, the aluminum around the windows. Um, and the only um, solution that they felt worked best sorry, to uh, clean the aluminum was uh, to do it manually. And there's about 18,000 linear feet of aluminum um, if you were to add up all the aluminum around the entire first, second and third floors. 
So that resulted in a, an additional cost of, of 250,000. Uh, the third scope change was um, to change the, uh, the doors on the um, leading down from council down to the uh, green roof platform. That's an additional uh, 280,000. So that's where the 530,000 comes from. And then a cost associated with the um, delays by the stakeholders, Heritage Preservation Services to look at at, at different options, including the windows, which resulted in another approximately 600,000. So that, that accommodates for about 70,000, sorry, 70% 70 of, the, of the scope change. The additional 15% is tied to the uh, remediation abatement of the, um, of the asbestos, and then we've got another about 15% in contingency, which brings us up to about uh, $2 million. This, it seems like in the past couple months there has been two projects where Heritage Services uh, has been involved and um, because of their delay it's costing us an extra $600,000. Like why, why the delay? I, this is the second time that there's been an item that's brought forward where Heritage was involved and it's cost us an additional amount. Um, the uh, additional day delay, sorry, through the chair, the, the, the additional delay was a result of the request of additional mock-ups, which is, uh, is shown in figures, uh, sorry, um, four and five. So that's what caused the, uh, the additional delay in getting those mock-ups done and approved by, uh, by Heritage Preservation Services. Okay, I have the, no more questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fillion, you're next. Uh, the, um, the aluminum, has that work been done already? Uh, no, it has not. No. Through the chair. The cleaning has been done. The, sorry, um, sorry, the cleaning has been done, yes. Okay, so probably a moot point, but how long um, will it stay clean for? Well, the last time it was cleaned, they haven't been cleaned in, in almost uh, 53 years, so I would imagine we wouldn't have to do it for about another 50 years. But do we, did we get any information on that, for example, they wouldn't be looking bad in two years? Like, is, if we spent that much money, I hope it's something that will uh, make it be bright and shiny for a long time. But we don't like know that, pennies. right? Uh, at, at this point, I don't, but I, I believe that it would, they would stay clean for a relatively long time. But it's, is it like, do we have any information on whether it was coated with something so that it's easy to clean next time or did we, or did we just take whatever somebody said here, do it this way and that's, and that's what we spent $250,000 on. So through the chair, through our uh, facilities management program, I will ensure that as part of the window cleaning that we clean the uh, aluminum on a regular basis so that they, th that that sheen remains. No, no, sure, but I, and that's great, but I just, uh, I, I'm just looking for, di was there any discussion about uh, when we're spending that much money on cleaning that we also, you know, applied whatever substance might keep it, make it easy to clean, or, or did we just spend that much to clean it and with no thought to ongoing issues? Um, through the chair, that, that wasn't considered, uh, it wasn't considered as part of how long the shine would last, but as part of our preventative maintenance program, when we clean the windows, we're ensure that the, there's ongoing polishing of the, of the aluminum so it, we don't run into this having to clean it 50 years from now. With That's significant the, cost. Um, with the, the film, um, what can, are you able to say what the incident was that triggered the perceived need for the film on, on three floors? Um, through the chair, that is part of a, a confidential report through security, so you'd have to follow up with security. Okay. And um, is there anyone here from security? It's because I have questions on the film itself, and I do appreciate the briefing um, that you gave me last week, and I'm good with uh, most of this. I just had um, further questions on the film. I know there's various um,
types of film, various costs for film, depending on what you want it to do, and it ranges from stopping somebody from, you know, breaking the window with a with a brick or getting in after they break the window with a brick to uh, um, it standing withstanding a, a big blast of some kind. So I just don't, don't know what what we chose here for each floor and whether we chose different levels of security for each floor and that sort of thing, just because it is a big ticket item. Do we have the answer to that? Um, th through the chair, I do not, but we can follow up with security and get that information for you. Okay, that would be great. And then the, the final question on that, which probably there's nobody here to answer, but did we negotiate any kind of a deal? Um, and, and how does the procurement work with something like this film um, that I know, like if you're a homeowner and get this film and you are get a certain amount of it, you get a discount. Like, does the city get a big discount for ordering a quarter million dollars worth of film? Uh, through the chair, we use the recommended contractor that security provided us, and then, and then our contractor would then get the pricing from that, uh, from that preferred vendor that security chose. But do we just accept the, I, I don't know what the, whether you have a list price on this sort of thing, but do we just accept whatever the price is or do we try to ne negotiate uh, a price or is that some, and if somebody was going to negotiate a price, would it be security or would it be yourselves? Um, through the chair, through our, our change process, we would, would review the pricing with the contractor and negotiate the price. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Holliday, questions of staff? Thank you. Uh, first couple of questions uh, will be to the facility staff, and I think the follow-up will be for purchasing staff. Um, I just wanted to go back over, on page 11 of the report, there's a very helpful table, and it talks about uh, one, two, three, four different categories plus a contingency of work. So I understand the first category uh, on security film, the second category had to do with the aluminum snap caps in the doors. The third category was kind of a broad bucket and then the last one was spoke about the concealed conditions. It's the, uh, the broad bucket, costs associated with project extension, labor materials, price increases, insurance bond extensions. What I heard, and it, maybe I've missed something here that had to do with, if I've got, do I have this right, that had to do with the, the window mock-ups um, can you elaborate a little bit more on what the extension work was relating to? Was it relating to the, any of the other buckets or was it just an extension of the project? No, it's, it's related to the overall project and to the um, concealed conditions. So... If you'd like, I can provide a breakdown. So the um, labor cost increase and the aluminum tariffs is approximately 190 k um, in order to increase the amount of work that's left, um, it would, um, would have to double the crews. That would be another 190 K and then the balance, um, due to, uh, increase in labor costs and bonding and insurance is another 200 K, which brings us to approximately 600 K. So what was the double cruise for? Was that to finish the project on time or what, what is that additional labor associated with? It's, it's, it's associated with the extension of time due to the delays in, in completing the mock-ups. Okay, understood. So the project just got stretched longer, the contractor is working longer, got it? Exa uh, through the chair, that is correct, and we want to complete the project before the next winter as well. So what was the first 190K of labor that you mentioned to do with tariffs? Well, it's, it's, said, a said, it's a combination of, of increase in labor costs and uh, aluminum tariffs. And what were those first uh, labor costs associated with? Into 2018. It, it was um, um, the um, extension in the uh, 2018. So those, the 197 is a, is a result of cost extensions in 2018, and then the additional 190 is a cost extension for 2019. Okay, and that's all pertaining to the original scope of work. 
even though we just took longer, we made some decision points. Through the chair, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Over to procurement, um, a slightly different line of questioning. I have two minutes here. Can you give me a, a slight overview of how it works with contract extensions and the relationship with single sourcing and how it works at the city in terms of internal approvals until we get to the point of council or committee where one needs to be approved. And I'll make note, I'm pretty sure that some of these items that are being sought today are actually completed. That's what I heard. So how does our procurement process work and has it worked in this case? Through you, Chair. I, I missed the last part of your question. Sure. Please so, repeat. Um, so just, it's just a general question. So how does a contract of this size get approved for an extension of this much? You know, what is the journey it takes to get to this committee? Who approves it? What do our policies say? And then in particular in this case, I thought I heard, and I think I saw when I was walking into uh, City Hall, that some of the work actually had already been done, but we're here getting the approval at committee. So how do the mechanics of that work? So we, according to uh, the procurement bylaw, the, the divisions have, can process a purchase order of amendment. There is a briefing note that accompanies that request. At, at the time of review, it's either the buyer reviews those requests with the client division to determine if it is within scope or out of scope. Following that, there are certain delegated authorities of award through the financial control bylaw. There are certain values that are approved up to $500,000 within the staff authority. And then anything over and above that value is submitted to committee for approval. Now, is the submission to committee done after the work is done? Is that normal course? And make note, it's not, I'm not asking the question in particular in this case, but there's a few of them in, in my binder today that seems like that that in some cases it is pre-planned they uh, reports come to committee with the intention of getting approval for future work um, and in some cases the work was already completed okay and is that all in, in accordance with the process and uh, as I don't know the process that well that's why I'm asking is that all in accordance with the process and the flow of how it is expected to work and how it should be flowing out it, it is expected to receive approval prior to the expenditure of the funds. However, depending on the circumstance in, in construction, for example, sure. uh, the incident occurs while they're throughout the project and they report after the fact. Um, during the election period, uh, is there any special consideration given to timing? Last question, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So during the election period, there is a recess. During the recess, um, uh, there is a delegated authority that is given to the bid award panel committee to award any contracts that would normally be approved either by committee or by council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else has questions of staff? Councillor Matlow. So last, and last, uh, general government meeting would would you remind me how much you requested and we awarded to, to you to uh for for uh for costs associated with uh that matter with heritage i, I forget it, all the details now but i just remember you came to us for a significant amount through the chair the the original ask um last month last month right yeah. was was just over three million dollars um, we've gone back and we've removed uh, from this amendment um, the spandrel panels. So if you look at... Uh, Wait, I, I, I'm not asking for, for a lot of detail in your, in your response. Right, so we've, re we've reduced... $3 million. We've reduced $570,000 from this. You, you, but you came to us with a request for $3 million. That is correct. This month, you're coming to us for an additional $2 million. That is correct. So with so, respect so to, we've reduced it, the contract value. If I, so. if I, I know you've got some scripted notes there, but I'm not, I'm just, I, okay. I, 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 you'll, have, you'll have an opportunity to tell us the good work you're doing, but I just want to, I want to ascertain something. So you came to us for $3 million, now you've come for $2 million. And how long, uh, is somebody here from Heritage? 
Nobody's here from Heritage? Does anybody know what year Toronto City Hall was uh, designated a Heritage Building? It's been a while, huh? We do. I think it's 1991. Oh. We do. We do. Yeah, I Give us a Google it if you don't know. Yeah. No, we have it in the report, actually. Remind me. It was 19. Ninety-one? Ninety, Nineteen. Through the chair, 1991. <laughs> Thank you both. So it's been a heritage designated building since 1991. Is there a process, or is, it, is there a step in the process before undertaking work on a heritage building, especially one that's been a heritage building for so long, to meet with heritage preservation services proactively to ascertain what considerations need to be made to mitigate what has happened, which is that over and over again, something's been done or something's about to be done. Heritage Services seems to go, oh, wait a sec, hold on for a moment. Then there are delays, then there are changes, and then there's requests for millions of more dollars. So through, through the chair, uh, there was extensive consultative input uh, with all of the stakeholders, inclu including Heritage uh, pretender. Um, then there was a change in personnel in um, with with Heritage Preservation Services uh, post tender, which resulted in a in a, in a delay and in, in additional mock-ups. But um, as you I introduced the motion last month um, to ensure that uh, head of planning and preservation services now sign off on on the scope of work happening in any heritage. Uh, facility, this will will minimize that impact. Well, and I'm glad that my motion helped uh, going forward. I'm trying to understand how this all got so screwed up that we're sp during, for example, during uh, our budget meeting, I was trying to uh, get uh, youth spaces uh, approved uh, for the most vulnerable kids in our in our city, and uh, you know, uh, for between one and two million dollars, I couldn't get it approved. And I'm hearing uh, you come every single month, with all due respect, but you come every, every, and it's not your fault individually, but I just mean it frustrates me to, to, to you know, continuously be asked for millions and millions and millions more dollars because there was some sort of delay or, or, or somebody didn't, you know, there was a job change or, uh, so I need to understand, and I believe council needs to understand, like what happened here? Because we're spending millions of dollars and I just, how do we account for that? Um. Through the chair, I can't I can't speak for um, Heritage Services, but you know we 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 um, we did extensive consultative input with Heritage Services, and and uh, they requested additional mock-ups post uh, post tender, which resulted in this delay and increased cost. So we've it is a lessons learned from both the uh, facilities management side, and between my director and myself, have put in. Uh, a new process so this doesn't happen again, not only from your motion, but all overall from a change control process, that any added scope has to be considered but from a time cost and scope perspective before it even comes forward. Okay, well, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be moving a motion to understand, to better understand uh, uh, what happened here uh, so that we really do have lessons learned and that there's some accountability because this just, I just find this, I find it remarkable, I do. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Are there questions of staff? I think that's been everybody. Um, speakers, Councillor Nunziata, you held this item? Uh, yeah, uh, well, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm very concerned and I'm not blaming the staff that are here, but it seems like every month when we get these reports, uh, there's always additional funds that are that's being requested and we're talking millions of dollars and you know last month it was three million dollars with heritage and now this month and I mean if there's an issue with it with heritage then we need to we need to resolve it uh, and why are the why do we have these delays like we're talking a lot of money, you know, like millions of dollars, and, and we shouldn't, I know they're coming forward, and some of the work has been done, you're absolutely correct, just to rubber stamp these, uh, these reports, but, um, it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's frustrating to see these reports come in every month and for additional funds, uh, increase in labor because of heritage delays, and it's, 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 
there seems to really be a problem um, within this department. I, I, I don't know, and I'm not blaming you personally, but I, I know other departments are involved when you do go out um, and they comment, but if there's issues with uh, heritage, then it should be brought forward to us, to council, to address, to find out why why there's an issue and why is the delay because it's costing it's costing us uh, millions of dollars so that's the reason i held it down and questioned it but i mean the work has been done there's not really much you can do i mean the work has been done so that's it okay thank you councillor uh councillor holiday uh, mr chair i do have a motion i just want to make sure that uh, clerk staff have that ready i can hear them typing away Yes. We're good, wonderful. I will speak briefly, but I'll just introduce the motion. Thank you. Uh, and it's just a request uh, for the Chief Purchasing Officer to report to us uh, on the bylaws, our policies and our practices regarding contract extensions and or sole sourcing, because the two can be interlinked, uh, including looking at what the internal um, process is leading up to uh, uh, a council or a, in this case a committee report and if there's recommended changes bring that to the committee here um, it's a very generic request because it pertains to uh, a, a few of the reports that we have seen at this committee and, and building upon councillor Nunziata's comments um, you know I, I, I am too worried that sometimes things come here the work has been completed or there were changes in scope throughout the project. Uh, and in the case, this particular case, Heritage Preservation Services were basically writing the checks that facilities needed to cash. They were requesting changes to scope. They were requesting mock-ups. Facilities, I don't think, has a choice to say no. They've got to honor the, the, the process and the framework with Heritage Preservation Services. But HPS is not carrying the budget for the project, so they don't have any check and balance, they can ask for as much as they need. Uh, and it just drives the project cost up. And then here we are at the end of the process and the buck stops at the committee's desk to say, look, we had to go through all this work, we've run over on the budget, you know, can you, you, can you make a square here with the purchase order? And you know what, the, the business case to do this may be solid. Like it, it may be obvious that you use the same contractor uh, it may be obvious that the work needed to be done. Like I, I you know, if it cost two hundred fifty thousand dollars to correctly clean the aluminum, then that's fine, and that's what needs to be done. But um, it's maybe the timing of it that uh, troubles me a bit, and I think it. I think I sense that around the committee table here as well. Uh, and it's not just the one file; it just seems to be um, over and over. And again, I, I don't think anything is wrong here. I think the process has been followed. Uh, everyone's doing the best they can to manage these projects. Uh, but sometimes it's about the public perception on it. Sometimes it's making sure that we get the best price. And when does you know there, there be so many changes in a particular contract that you start to ask the question, should we just be going to a different contractor? Or is it the same spirit of the procurement? And the policies that I've read on that talk a little bit about you know a 10% change in something. Uh, whether or not the original scope was followed versus a new scope and there are some guidance in there but I, I'd like to take a closer look at that and maybe it's an education piece for this committee but if there are ways to uh, look at these processes and the timing of it is there a, an internal staff sign-off process that leads right up to maybe the DCM level before it comes to us so that others are um, saying yes we agree with uh, with good judgment has been used here to change the contract then I, I'd feel a whole lot better uh, understanding that process and if it's time to tweak that a little bit because of the sentiments of the committee here, then let's have an opportunity to have a look. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Councillor Matlow to speak. So uh, the, uh, my motion will uh, both uh, refer this to the next uh, government management committee uh, meeting and we'll also ask for accountability for uh, the process that was used uh, to, uh, that led to uh, cost overruns and further cost requests to our committee. Um, 
Heritage Preservation Services isn't here at the committee today to answer any questions. I spoke with the chair about this, and uh, not only uh, is that not uh, helpful to this discussion, uh, but there needs to be a better understanding uh, from their perspective of uh, why they asked, what they asked for, why the delays happened. We're hearing one side of the story, I need accountability, so do you, and we need to understand uh, both what went wrong so that we can move forward uh, with a better process. Um, I'm, um, I'm really disturbed by the fact that I've been, you know, here for two meetings on this committee, and in, on both occasions, uh, they've come to us for, uh, for uh, cost requests that have now gone up to the many millions of dollars uh, on, on a heritage building that we work in that, uh, I, 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 I get intuitively, and this is why I want to understand more from Heritage Services, their perspective, but intuitively, I would think that if there were proactive discussions early on, there would be at least a general understanding that there would be sensitivities to the building that may make it more expensive to, uh, to renovate uh, and retrofit, but uh, at least some general idea of where they're going. What's happened is, is that there seems to be after-the-fact conversations where uh, these members of staff and, and, and contractors are told, uh, whoa, slow down, you can't do that, oh, wait a sec, you got to do it a different way, uh, or I'm, I'm hearing again just in, in passing, but today, uh, that there is changeover in staff and complications that if that were to happen, then there should have been a plan to, in place to make sure that that transition didn't impact the cost of this project. One way or another, this just seems really screwed up and really expensive. And what I said earlier, I'm just going to reiterate, no matter what our budget priorities are, you know, I argued for uh, programs and spaces for vulnerable youth along with other priorities. Uh, each of you will have different priorities that you bring to our budget meetings to debate and struggle over, you know, how to, how to, how to fund all the different priorities in our city within the very, you know, res restricted envelope that we have. And then you'd kind of think that that's a whole other universe when I come into this committee. And like every month it's like, here's a few million dollars, here's a few million dollars to everybody. And it just seems like, and then we go back into our budget meeting once a year and it's like going down to the last $500,000, like what critical priority are we gonna fund? And then we come back here and say, like, oh yeah, we need a little more film for the windows. Can we have another $3 million? It just, it's absurd. And so what my motion, if it, when it gets up there, uh, almost there, uh, does is it, you know, here we go, um, refers it to the next committee meeting so that we have all relevant staff uh, in front of us to ask the questions that I know all of us have. And, uh, and then just both have some accountability for what occurred, but also I think all of us just need to understand what happened. Um, Far too often we come to these, these discussions and we kind of get bits and pieces and just enough and then we vote on it and just go to the next item. Uh, this is one of these cases where, and you know, Councillor Fillion's been through a few uh, at other committees, where I think we really need to understand the details of what occurred here because um, this can't happen again and I, it kind of makes me wonder if it happened here then you know, where else does it happen? So. Um, I hope that you'll support uh, this uh, this uh, request. Sorry, questions of Councillor Matlow? Yes, uh, Councillor Matlow, I agree with you 100%. That's why I held the item down, because it seems to be an ongoing issue. Um, but would you, I don't see anywhere in your motion that talks about security, having security here. Is that going to be included? Um, because the, the reason <clears throat> for, the, for the film was for security? Um, so that perhaps, be, um, and, and, and other relevant staff, uh, would that be fine? Or? Yeah, as long as they're here so we, um, okay. so we can ask them questions as well. So, so the, then how about adding uh, Heritage Preservations and other relevant staff? Sure. Yeah. I'll take that, you'll take that as a friendly amendment. Uh, in A, Heritage Preservation Services and other relevant staff, and that way, uh, and, then, and then if the, the clerk could undertake to uh, alert uh, security that they are part of that other relevant staff. Why don't you say security out? You want security in there? What? Well, okay. Because I'll we'll include here. security. Her Heritage Preservation Services, uh, okay. security, and other relevant staff. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Because we were told security. Okay. Thank you.
Councillor Holliday, you had a question? I, I did have a question of the mover, and I wondered, uh, Councillor Matlow, if you would consider this a friendly amendment. Uh, in my line of questioning to staff, I, I dug a little bit about, you know, what happened when it was delayed with the, the mock-ups and so on, and it added extra cost. And I had a chance to ask staff, and I said, you know, what happens if you don't get the money today? Uh, because they're deep financially into this, and they, their response to me uh, off microphone was there could be potentially additional costs because we're delaying the project longer. To that effect, I wondered if you would consider it a friendly amendment to give them some of the money that they've asked for, uh, and maybe the safest bucket of money is the remediation of concealed site conditions. I'm not sure if anyone in the committee had any concerns about the validity of that additional requirement. It was $320,000 out of the uh, two million being sought, and I wondered if you can consider that as a friendly amendment that gives them a bit of money to move along, but also brings the balance of the report back for our debate next, uh, next meeting. I, I suppose if there's a way to word it, that if there are clearly, um, I mean, it, it, it's a weird one, right? Because it's a referral, but you're also saying, you know, uh, 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 provide them. Uh, so you're saying off, off, uh, off mic, uh, they told you that, that, that they will incur uh, uh, higher costs on certain specifics because if they don't get money today to deal with those specific things right potentially like what this is is an increase in the purchase order and if they've run out of money on their project yeah and they do a you know they stop the work then that could have a financial impact from this is the problem the with contractor. this is the problem with them coming after the fact uh, agreed and agreed. It, but have it, they uh, spent all their money have you no have you do you not have any money on this project? Mr. Chair, can we, are we, uh, could you just allow us to have sure. maybe a little, a moment of dialogue yep. just to understand this? I mean, they must have some Pat, uh, did you want uh, Through answer? the chair, yes. So of the uh, 5.7, we're currently 75% spent to date. So, I mean, conceivably, three weeks may not uh, cause any delays. Okay. 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 Then, then that then that, that settles. I withdraw my friendly amendment. Right. Thank you. I asked okay. a question. They can come here bankrupt. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we have. Sorry, does anybody else want to speak up? So we're speaking. All right. No, we're speaking. We're beyond question. To them. We well, can turn around and ask them privately, but we're on, we're speaking. Okay. So there's no further speakers. Okay, Councillor Fillion. So on that last one, I just hope that the what I'm concerned about, similar to Councillor Holliday, is that the 25 um, percent that's left not be you know, kind of sweatered in areas that don't include um, something that's happening behind the walls while we're digging out the walls. That's all. I just, I just hope that with the three-week delay, we're not, uh, even though there's money left, it might be for other things. So I, I just, that's the question I wanted to ask, and I won't ask it. Um, I support both of the motions, and, you know, when something comes here, we're accountable for for scrutinizing it, voting on it, and we, um, you know, we're required to make informed decisions. We're accountable for making informed decisions. And items come to us where you can't make an informed decision because there's not enough detail. And the staff that bring it forward, I'm not sure whether they're, to, they're the ones to fault or not because I'm not sure the extent to which they're able to or feel they're able to push back against um, against other divisions who just say, here, this is what we need and this is what the bill is. Now you bring it forward to the committee. And, uh, you know, these are two parts of the city that I strongly support, security and heritage, and I think they both do a really good job, but it is troubling that they wouldn't think that they needed to be here to justify their expenditure and ask questions about it. It's just odd. It's just really odd. Um, so I'm I'm all for the the two motions and um, um, and obviously we're you know providing uh, 
we're doing our jobs here, and and uh, and I hope staff only see it as that. We're certainly not trying to um, make their lives difficult. We're just trying to make informed decisions. Thank you, Councillor Fillion. Sorry, Councillor Holliday, did you want to speak? Sorry, yes, you did. My apologies. Okay. Um, so. Yes, so we have a deferral motion first. Okay. Okay, so the first motion on the screen. This is a deferral motion by Councillor Holliday. Sorry. Councillor Matlow, need more coffee. All in favor? Carried. Uh, privilege perhaps it would just clarify to me that this actually what uh, these weren't two different matters but this was the, the, the last matter for back where yes so you were trying to say that you shaved off uh, some money it still means though that you're asking for millions of dollars and the point remains the same but I do appreciate your efforts to try to shave off uh, some of the costs okay thank you uh, our next item number four uh, amendment to blanket contract number Four seven zero two zero seven eight one with costs at communications. Councillor Fillion, do you have questions of staff on number four? Asking Mr. Williams. Um, I guess this is my first question. If uh, if I was to move deferral for three weeks to till our April 21st meeting so that we could get some additional information, is the, is that does that cause you any problems? Well, I think it's important for a committee to be fully informed, so I'm happy to do that. I think our situation is different than the one you just talked about, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions in the meantime and bring it forward three weeks from now. That's fine. So would you, if, um, if I was going to make a deferral motion, would you, in addition, want to answer questions today or wait till next month? Well, you might as well wait. It'd be more efficient, I suspect, for committee okay. to do it all at one time. Okay, and I, I do have a deferral motion that if it's okay, okay. the staff, right. I'll just move that. Okay, are there other questions of staff on this item? Okay, speakers, Councillor Fillion. I'm sorry if I could get my motion. Are you ready on this? Yes. Yep, okay. Motion on the screen by Councillor Fillion. I don't have my glasses, but I think I can read it. That consideration of the item be deferred until the April 23rd, 2019 meeting of the General Government Licensing Committee so that the appropriate staff can provide further details on projects and costs associated with those projects for work completed and work associated with the additional funding requested. Perfect. You didn't need your glasses, Councillor. <laughs> Any questions of the mover? Seeing none. So other speakers on this item? Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to move my uh, report request again, but uh, I'm not going to do that because I'm quite confident this committee is going to defer the, uh, the report. Uh, so it will become a redundant motion. But uh, I hope when these items do come back, uh, the committee will support the idea of taking a closer look at the processes around, uh, and it was enshrined in the motion that got deferred in the last one, just the processes around how contract extensions um, develop, right? And they're going to happen. Um, you know, how do they proceed through staff? How, do, how is check-in done? How is the senior management team look at that? And put all of the things into the balance scale of figuring out when is it time to extend a contract? When is it time to just stop and, and move to a new one and what are all the considerations and then finally you know the time frame that it takes to get to uh, committee or council and also being uh, cognizant of the time frame that uh, could put pressure on all of this because of the long process to come to committee and council and are there ways to tweak and improve that because uh, again the comments of the committee members I think there's a bit of discomfort with um, some of the things that come forward and us struggling to understand because as Councillor uh, Fillion put it, ultimately we are accountable for those approvals and um, 
having maybe a better uh, line of sight through that process would be a helpful thing uh, so that when it culminates at a committee decision, it comes through a bit easier. And uh, with that, I guess there is no motion to move, but uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Uh, other speakers on this item? Seeing none, so we have a deferral motion before us. All in favor of deferring this for a month? Opposed? And that's unanimous. Okay. Our next item is number seven, non-competitive contract for essential medical services for Toronto Fire Services. Councillor Karajanis held it. Councillor, do you have questions of staff? Um, would, um, through the chair, would the staff be able to tell us what it's, um, this would be medical, if I'm not mistaken. These are people like trying to get their fitness tests and all that stuff. Would that be correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's correct. This is the, the position or the contract position we refer to as a chief medical officer for Toronto Fire Services. Yes, a medical doctor, counselor. This would not be somebody which uh, would be provide counseling for people suffering uh, PTSD or such other ailments. Would that be correct? Mr. Chair, that is that is correct. Uh, th this is a medical doctor. He is not a he is not a psychologist or a trained mental health professional. He the extent of his expertise and practice is to make a referral to those to those uh, experts in the case of mental health. How many people do we have uh, off that are suffering either PTSD or stress related uh, uh, work related uh, ailments? Mr. Chair, my most recent data indicates that there are 60 personnel from. Uh, Toronto Fire Services presently on WSIB or off work on WSIB, 36 of those or 60% are indicated as being on, on a combination of post-traumatic stress, occupational stress injury and traumatic mental stress. Do you, do you have a, um, a, 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 do you have a, a, a specialist, uh, be it a, a doctor, a psychologist, psychiatrist that works with these folks? Do you, do you have the resources to for these uh, for the for the, the work that they're doing to be answered mr chair in the uh, approved 2019 budget toronto fire services was provided with funding to move forward with the implementation of what in the first year will be a half time so in essence two and a half days a week uh, the provision of a dedicated uh, counselor that will work uh, dedicated to toronto fire services working on on these types of issues in view of what's happening right now uh, with other services, especially with OPP and the veterans, I mean, we just heard an OPP officer just a couple of weeks ago um, that committed suicide and other OPP officers that are the same and certainly the veterans. Uh, do, you have, do you have adequate s support for your folks that right now are, are off on stress leave or su uh, suffering from PTSD? Mr. Chair, the, the funding provided in 2019 and the implementation of this, of the counselor in 2019 is uh, certainly a, a step in the right direction. I will say, Councillor, that this is, uh, this is a piece of an overall program that we're offering. We've invested heavily and continue to invest heavily on the front end and proactively with respect to things like uh, the uh, Road to Mental Readiness, which is a resiliency training program. And we have a number of other supports in place. I should also note, Councillor, that in the last collective agreement bargaining, the uh, mental health and psychologi psychologist um, support services provision within the collective agreement for the firefighters was increased to $3,500. So we're on the right path. I can tell you that we will implement um, the half-time FTE counselor this year and certainly uh, that will come with it a number of metrics and uh, performance indicators and should that need to be expanded or continued or evolved they'll be back to you in the 2020 budget with the, uh, with the request. Let me clarify that. You're saying that somebody that's suffering from P PTSD can go to a psychiatrist or a specialist and can c get coverage up to $3,500? That's the collective agreement benefit coverage counselor. That's in addition to anything that's funded under WSIB. So post-traumatic stress disor disorder specifically is covered under provincial presumptive legislation and therefore those costs, once a PTSD claim is approved by the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, those costs uh, for medical care are funded by, the, by WSIB or through WSIB. Um, I know that you probably don't want to answer this question, but I'm, I'm going to put it gently. If I was to tell you that you need more than half a time, half, uh, half, uh, half person uh, for, for psychiatrists to help people with PTSD, and you probably need a full person, would you disagree with me? 
Uh, through the chair, councillor, I, I suspect that that may well be the case. I, I can say though that uh, we're working in close collaboration with employee health services. That was the rationale for introducing the half FT this year. In addition to, to securing and sourcing the person, we need to build out the programming and the necessary processes and procedures. So we're moving forward in a systematic method. We may well need to expand that counselor. And if that's the case, as I said, I will be back to you with the request in 2020. And that would be for the budget, right? Uh, that's correct. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Karajanis. Other questions of staff on this item? Yeah, I just have one question. Councillor Nunziata. So um, you've selected Dr. Foreman. So who, um, who's been there pre uh, previously? Or did you, was there anybody? Through the chair, uh, this, this is a long-standing position. Dr. Foreman has served in this role since actually prior to amalgamation. Oh, okay, so he's always been there. This is, uh, Dr. Foreman has served as our contract chief medical officer for many, many years. This is simply a continuation of those essential services. I see, okay, thank you. Other questions of staff? Councillor Karajanis, you held the item? Uh, no questions of staff. Speak, speak. yep. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, really appreciate the chief and, and, and his thoughtfulness and certainly his, can, his candor on this matter. Uh, Chair, I, I'm going to move staff recommendations, but before I'm doing that, I'd like for all of us to sort of pause for, for 30 seconds and bring to uh, and, and remember what happened with the, um, the OPP officers. They had a, a number of them that were certainly had committed suicide because of stress, of work related stress. Our veterans, uh, in a, a bigger picture are also facing the same. And certainly we have staff uh, within the department, the uh, fire department that are, are, are feeling the stress. And I, having personally worked with uh, a couple of folks in the um, emergency um, EMS, uh, they have more people on stress leave than, than the fire department. And we, they're called upon on, on a regular day basis to, to perform uh, work that some of us would not even think about. So when the uh, request comes next year from the fire department for a full-time person, I think that we should remember our conversation that we've had here and certainly support them on this issue because these are our frontline individuals. These are our first responders. And if they're in well mental capacity, they will only be there to assist and make sure that we are able to, um, uh, to get out of a, a dangerous situation. I mean. Can you imagine having a firefighter that, that, uh, that responds to a call and that individual, he or she is um, under uh, stress and uh, although we expect of them to fully uh, perform their duties, uh, stress might set in and, uh, and uh, prevent them from doing that and I, I don't think that's the case but certainly I would say to you that um, we all need to be responsible for this and to make sure not only to the fire department and uh, uh, Chief, we, uh, we, we thank your, your men and women for their service and your staff, but also to our police department and the first responders, the, the EMS. So with that, Chair, I, uh, I'll move staff recommendations. Okay, thank you, Councillor Karagiannis. Councillor Holliday, do you have questions of the mover? Not at all, I just wanted to speak. Okay. I, I'd just like to Senator move the, uh, the motion that I tried to in the last two items. Um, and I can read it, that the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer and the Controller be requested to examine the bylaws, policies, internal practices regarding contract extensions and or sole sourcing, including staff internal considerations, approvals and reporting timeframes to City Council and report recommended changes to the Government Licensing Committee. And it's because the last two items were deferred, um, I'd like an opportunity to uh, get, allow the staff to work on this report and uh, I noticed that this was a, a sole source, so I think it would be in order to move it here, even though the, uh, the two items aren't necessarily linked. It's the same motion as the previous. Anybody have any questions of the mover? Yeah. Councillor Karajanis. Um, through the chair, this is not reflective of 3.7. This is a, a, a general, much more general, um, uh, I guess, scope that you're aiming at. It is. Is there a possibility for us to, uh, to move it on another item versus this particular item? It could, but I think this is the last item. Is it? There's one other, but it doesn't have anything to do with purchasing. It is not a purchasing, you're right. 
I, I'm just wondering, I, this is certainly, um, although I, I know where you're going, but certainly um, it, it sends out the wrong message, in my view anyways. Uh, you know, it, it, okay, so sorry, your question of Councillor Holliday. Yeah, I, I mean, don't, don't, don't you agree that this sends out the wrong message? I mean, we're not, we're, we're particularly zeroing in on the fire, uh, uh, you know, on this particular item. We're not zeroing in on any of the other items. Well, Councillor Karajanis, I didn't mention uh, Toronto Fire at all in the motion. Uh, well, what does this say there? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, with the fire chief. Yep, my apologies. That wasn't uh, what I signed. Sorry, Councillor Holliday, I must have been the last part. Yeah, no, I, I didn't sign off on the fire service in there. Um, I, I simply asked the clerks to move the previous motion. In the uh, the time frame here, we didn't have an exchange to exchange pieces of paper. Yep. Uh, thank you, Councillor Kerry Janice. I didn't even notice that. Um, sure. Yep. If the clerks advise that uh, Toronto Fire Services is required to be in the motion, then I'm happy to withdraw the motion because it it need not involve that specific department. Yep. So this item deals with Toronto Fire Services. So. Yes. To make this motion up, so it's to have this motion apply to this item, we have to have Toronto Fire Services in the motion. Okay, uh, fair enough, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I didn't receive that advice so far, so I, it, with your indulgence, I would love to withdraw it because it, it need not involve Toronto Fire Services. Okay, all right. So, point of order, um, would it be possible for the committee to agree for Councillor Holiday to add this as an additional item and we can deal with it that way? I, think I, I would be thrilled if we could do that. Yep, so why don't we do withdraw? You want to? Please. We can add this on after the next item if you want. Yep, and with the deepest respect to the clerks, I know they were putting it in, mo in, in yep. order and I didn't have a chance to see those words. Okay, so I need a motion to withdraw Councillor Holliday's motion. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Holliday, maybe just work with the clerks quickly and after our next item, we can Right, yep, we'll go back to the original on. wording, thanks. Okay, so then. The only item we have is recommendations. Yeah, so we have the recommendations in the report moved by Councillor Karajanis on this item. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, and our next item is GL 3.8, Startup and Residence Pilot Project for the City of Toronto. Uh, Deputy Mr. Brian Kelsey with the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Morning, Mr. Kelsey. You have uh, five minutes whenever you're ready. It had been uh, over the fall uh, writing to senior members of the public service to encourage them to go ahead with a startup and residence program. For those of you who are new to the concept, I'll explain that in a moment. And we're, uh, we're pleased to learn of uh, Councillor Ainsley and other elected officials' interest in uh, proceeding with this independent of our efforts and discussions with the public service. Uh, a startup and residence program basically does uh, five things. Uh, a city or a public agency or government would identify a rolling series of broad uh, public policy challenges or operational challenges. They invite startups to compete to solve them. Uh, doing this means updating your city procurement protocols to allow that competition to serve the, uh, the need to have a competitive uh, function in Canadian or uh, North American, pro American procurement law. Yeah. The winner, uh, winning startup of these competitions um, would uh, then work with the relevant city department, agency, uh, or staff unit uh, to uh, test delivery of their particular idea, project, or solution uh, for a set period, 16 weeks is not uncommon. And if it works, uh, the startup walks away with proof of concept and a potential customer. And the, uh, the city walks away with a potential solution to its problem and the option to buy in or reject in that particular case. This is a cheap alternative, costs very little money. The primary cost is the staff time working with the, the, the winning firm to see if their, their solution works. It's a fast solution, I'll get to that in a second, but you get results from this in terms of improved city services in a matter of months, not years. Uh, and it's a tested solution, uh, which I'll get to in a second as well. But um, I know the question may come, why do this when the city's already working with a Bloomberg Innovation team uh, and you already have a partnership uh, and MOU with Mars to promote startups in the city? 
And it's critical to realize that the primary goal of a startup and residence program isn't to create more startup successes, although that is uh, virtually certain to be a benefit. Rather, the point of this exercise is distinct from just working with Mars to get more startups happening in the city. It's to help the city's public service become legally, procedurally, and practically ever more comfortable with the discipline of innovation, the necessary policies, and the challenge of procurement that is more open to innovative products and services from smaller companies. Uh, this idea was first discussed in Toronto in uh, newspapers locally in 2014. San Francisco piloted this project through their mayor's office. Since then, San Francisco, Edmonton, BC, Boulder, San Jose, San Diego, Portland, Peoria, Memphis, Miami-Dade, Vegas, uh, the uh, Massachusetts Bay Area Transit Agency, the state of Pennsylvania, have all gone ahead and worked through a network created by San Francisco to deliver, deliver similar versions of this. So more and more cities, more and more states, more and more public agencies are seeing value in this and the network is growing as proof of concept that this can help. Uh, three cities worth noting have done this independently of that network, Kansas City, Pittsburgh, and most interestingly, Guelph. Tiny Guelph, population 120,000, uh, resolved to go ahead with this uh, in early 2016. Uh, managed to deliver a three-challenge startup and residence progress uh, system in August 2016 with firms selected for two of those challenges. Uh, they held a, de a demo day that I was uh, privileged to attend uh, to show off the results of what the two startups they'd actually gone through the process with had delivered in February 2017. So again, we're talking about a time scale of months to deliver successfully on this. And Alert Labs, which is the most interesting of, of Guelph's winners of this competition, a Kitchener-based firm uh, managed to rapidly expand off of the success of this program, but more importantly for Guelph, what they got was a cheap, easy to deploy, customer-funded technology solution to reduce uh, by a massive degree the amount of water leakage that was happening in the broader Guelph system, which uh, saves them money in terms of uh, in terms of capital needs for their waterworks, helps with water cons uh, conservation, but is also saving customers in terms of their own uh, their own water bills. So, if Guelph can deliver this, we believe certainly Toronto can. And there's now three options, thanks to that history for Toronto to pursue. And we're uh, glad to see uh, Councillor Ainsley's motion reflects this. Uh, Toronto, if it wants to proceed on its own, I don't want to speak for a public agency without its permission, but I know there's at least one agency that's not under the city's purview that may be interested in directly partnering with the city if you choose to proceed independently. Um, option two is that Guelph had such success with its program, it's now partnering with Barry and London to create a municipal innovation exchange. That's got provincial funding with some conditions attached, uh, but that offers an opportunity to work with those uh, municipalities, or you could work as Edmonton has with the San Francisco network. The option's up to you. We encourage you to go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Kelsey. Uh, questions of the deputant? Uh, I have a few. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming in this morning. So um, I just wanted to ask, so uh, startup and residency program, how uh, this would differ from a traditional RFP process? That's the point, is that <clears throat> um, for those of you who over many years through your council service have run into this challenge. The problem with showing up with an innovative product or service to a Canadian municipality is partly, you know, call it moral and partly legal, legal in the sense that you as a city are expected to have a competition to weigh the benefits, to weigh the prices and so forth for products and services before you can buy them. But if the product or service is truly new and truly innovative, you have no benchmark to compare to. So what cities that go through this process have done, what Guelph did under Canadian law to prove that it was possible to do so uh, in partnership with, um, with their, their local university and other advisors, is they created a legal procurement process that said, look, the competition to get in with your new product or service meets the competitive test for procurement, and they created the necessary uh, uh, data and uh, uh, IP agreements to allow for that partnership to, to test the proof of concept for startups to go forward. So you already have a model in Canadian law with Guelph to follow, uh, and I'm sure they'd be happy to help um, if you wanted to proceed to do the same thing here. So this is, this is a procurement exercise that helps a lot of departments in the city get better at working with uh, new products, new services, new companies, rather than something that's exclusively about 
growing the number of technology startups in the city. Okay, and would you consider this radical? Well, not anymore. It, it was a radical idea at the time when San Francisco first started it because most other cities that were trying to achieve similar things were doing things like buying equity partnerships and startups or creating venture funds to partner with firms. The radical part with, with the model is that it's, it's very light. You're not making an agreement with these companies to buy their products. You're just making an agreement to test them. You're not making an agreement to spend money on these companies. They have to show up with their own financing to work with you. You're just making an agreement to allow them to compete. And if their idea makes it through the first phase, to actually let them in the door to work with them on proof of concept. And again, if, if you don't like any of the concepts coming forward, you don't have to take them. Guelph refused. Uh, on their third challenge to take any of the companies that had been because they didn't see a benefit. But if you do like it, you suddenly got proof of concept for a new service or a new idea that's been tested right here in Toronto that you can deliver just like that. Okay, and, and in your remarks, um, and I know as well, there's a large number of American cities that use this. Uh, most recently in Canada, Edmonton, Guelph, there's a, there's a STIR network in Canada now. For the city of Toronto to do something like this and be involved in it, if we got involved in it, it, it's not so far outside of the box that, you know, we're going to see the Auditor General here saying, like, what the heck are you doing with your procurement system? Well, I, and, you know, point one is if you want to, and it's the city's choice, draw on the experience of other cities, the formulas, the legal text, that's all there. Uh, I tweeted earlier this morning one report on Guelph's program by the Brookfield Institute. There have been others. So the template's already there to do this without needing to start from scratch. But on the other hand, if you did want to start with, from scratch, again, Guelph has completed in 2018 a round um, that's being praised by everybody in the technology and procurement community as a model to follow. If Guelph can do it without uh, errors or mistakes, I, I believe Toronto can get by. Okay, and then my last uh, question again. So on this, so I'm not asking for a store program right across the city for you know, every area. It's very specific to looking at pro procurement and more importantly, I think e-procurement. Um, and that's been done in other cities successfully, I understand. Yes, I, I mean, the, the, the biggest difference between different cities in terms of how they've run this model is how they pick the challenge and how that works rather than uh, the precise procurement model. So that uh, some cities, especially San Francisco in the earlier stages, chose very broad challenges and said, can you give us something on transportation or mobility? Other cities have gone with more focused questions. Again, uh, Guelph with the Alert Labs uh, procurement, the challenge on that was find us something that helps with water conservation because it's a, a high public priority. But that's, that's one reason this works to get new products and startups to the table, is it frames the RFP in terms of what's the problem you can help us solve as opposed to being hyper-specific as public RFPs tend to be now in how to solve it. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Kelsey. Any other questions of the deputy? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in this morning. Uh, questions of staff? Nobody? So I just, since I have Mr. Williams and Mr. Meikle here. Um, so Mr. Meikle, there, there's other examples of STIR programs that have been done successfully in Canada. Um, the city of Edmonton, for example, they did a, a three-pronged one uh, last fall. Um, but I, I so the, the area I'm interested in is e-procurement more specifically. and you think this, would this be doable for us if, and I know I'm asking for a report back. Yeah, uh, through, or to you, Mr. Chair. Um, we will look into that and make sure that we include that. We wanna provide a good synopsis um, and explore these opportunities. We have had some preliminary discussion between uh, General Manager of Economic and Culture, Mike Williams, and the Chief Procurement Officer, Michael Pashalock. We've already started those discussions and we'll make sure we address those items and cite those examples too. Okay, all right. all right, thank you very much. Um, speakers, sir, Councillor Fillion? Just, no, it's short. This is right. Sure. <laughs> I just wanted to, uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair, for always bringing, being open to new ideas and bringing them forward to this committee. Thank you, all right. And I'm gonna be moving the recommendations in the report. I think this is very uh, innovative. Um, you know, as we're looking, we've had lots of discussions around procurement and e-procurement. I think this is a very uh, exciting opportunity and I'll be moving the recommendations. All in favor?
Opposed? And that carries unanimously. And then we have one last item with Councillor Holliday. You had an item you wanted to introduce? I do, Mr. Chair. Um, that is uh, the motion that I had written up before and tried to move on a couple of items that got oh, deferred. Sorry, I just need a motion to add new business. I'll move a motion to add motion new business. Add new All business. in favor? Carried. Councillor Holliday? Would you like me to read the motion? Mr. Are we going to put it on the screen? If you want, I can read it out while we wait. Oh, there we go. There we go. That the General Government Licensing Committee requests the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer or the Controller to examine the bylaws, policies, and internal practices regarding contract extensions and or sole sourcing, including staff internal considerations, approvals, reporting time frames to City Council, and report recommended changes to the General Government and Licensing Committee. Um, and I will thank Councillor Carrier Janis for pointing out the, the change in uh, the previous item. Uh, it wasn't my intent to uh, zero in on any particular division, but just have a, a more general approach to our procurement process. Okay. With that, I hope you'll support it. Any questions of the member? I just had one, sir, Councillor Holliday, did you want to put a date on it? Um, I uh, had a good conversation uh, with the treasurer and I was going to allow him to uh, spend some time to figure out what date he needed on that. Okay. All right. Any other questions of the mover? Speakers? No? All in favor? Carried unanimously. And motion to adjourn. Councillor Matlow? All in favor? Carried. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.